Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel and this is Archie, a blue and gold macaw. <laughs> and I'm Kate Humble and this bird that doesn't look terribly well but is actually, I think, officially the soppiest parrot in the land is Nelson and she is a Moluccan cockatoo and she just loves being tickled under I her wings. I think she's rather attached. I don't, think, I don't think that Archie likes me very much. He keeps trying to, to escape. <laughs> He's amazing colours, isn't he? They're incredible. Did you know that parrots apparently Oh, there he goes, rushes off. <laughs> can see more colours than we can. Really? Isn't that incredible. I think he's rather taken a fancy to uh, the rest of the crew down there, <laughs> hasn't he? Whereas Nelson here and I are going to be, I think, together forever. <laughs> Here's what's coming up on today's programme. Out in Africa, the keepers from Longleat take part in a mission to save a giant bull elephant. The stuff of nightmares is waiting for us in Pet's Corner. And how on earth do you persuade a reluctant lion into a travel cage? But we're going to start out in Africa. Last month, I flew out to Kenya with five of the keepers from the safari park to see how many of the animals they look after live in the wild. What an amazing sight. Longleat is closely involved with a charity called the Tusk Trust, which is dedicated to saving Africa's endangered species. And we went along on, and even helped with, several of their operations. The last, and definitely the most dangerous, involved a huge bull elephant that had been gored in a fight. Ian Craig, the director of Lewa Conservancy, had treated the wound a few days before, but decided to go back to give him more antibiotics, despite the threat to his own life. The danger is obviously, if it's in a herd, it's the other animals coming. When you fire that dart, there's obviously a bit of noise. Those animals, certainly in the community areas, are pretty spooky, and they're used to a history of poaching up there, so any sort of bang, they're quite aggressive. Uh, we always take a firearm uh, just to protect ourselves, so one person is darting, uh, one person is covering you with a firearm. And really, whoever's doing the darting puts you know, their heart and soul in the hands of the guy behind them. The injured elephant was right up in the north of Kenya, and Ian asked some of the Longleat keepers to come along. Andy Hayton is experienced in looking after elephants. We've already seen some elephants here, but actually getting up close to one again is going to be something. And a big male as well, you couldn't wish for more. There was no room in the little plane for our crew, so we gave the keepers a video camera to take with them. It's a measure of Ian's commitment to saving wild species that he'll fly up the country, drive out into the bush, and then walk six kilometers into the middle of nowhere to help just one animal. And David Parkinson, who came out here with the British Army and who now works with the conservation team, suspects that people who've only seen elephants in captivity don't understand just how dangerous these operations can be. Elephants here in the wild are very, very dangerous animals and can turn on you in a heartbeat. A good friend of mine who was just watching a couple of elephants south of here uh, and their vehicle was suddenly hit from behind like an express train and the tusks went right through the rear of the vehicle straight through the cool box uh, and just missed his children sitting in the back seat. Of course, he then tried to drive away, but he couldn't because his rear wheels were off the ground. Uh, and the elephant then just pulled out and left. And it was as simple as that. Having said that, his car was a little bit damaged. Guided by local trackers, Ian finds the wounded bull deep in the bush. The injury to his leg is infected, and he'll die without a jumbo-sized dose of antibiotics. But first they'll have to knock him out with a sedative dart. Unlike a rifle, a dart gun isn't powerful enough to fire through the bush, so you have to get a clear shot from close range. Sometimes that's down to, you know, 10 or 15 metres. So, so uh, yeah, that's where it can go wrong. You get a charge, you haven't got a lot of room to run away. 
despite the very real personal risks, Ian successfully darts the bull and moves in to treat him. The growling noise is coming from the elephant. He's semi-conscious, and they have been known to come round without any warning. The Longleat keepers are here to witness and film what the Tusk Trust really do out in the wilds of Africa. Every animal comes, and if it doesn't, we shouldn't be here. He's a particularly magnificent animal, really. He's just probably one of less than a dozen animals in this country of that size and, and age. And so, you know, he has a special meaning in that context. A few hours later, they're all back at base. And for Ian, it's a job well done. It was great. I was worried that he wouldn't get up. He didn't go down in a great uh, in a sort of position, but he got up fine. Um, he's he's got a real chance. I'd give him 34, 30, 40 percent chance of, of a total recovery. So I, I'm pleased with it. It's been a long, hot, hard day's work, but for the keepers from Longleat, it's been a very worthwhile experience. It's seeing what what the money that gets poured into these kind of places it gets what well, it gets used for and to see it actually being sort of hands-on hopefully saving an elephant of those proportions I mean it's an, an amazing thing to see if these guys hadn't have intervened he would have died he, he you know he's, he's not through it yet but with no intervention that elephant would have died and for a fantastic animal like that I mean you just you know but watching these guys actually get hands-on and 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 they're you know, saving wildlife. Sounds corny, but they're, they're doing something. It's nice to be involved. Everything possible had been done to help the great bull, but he was badly injured, and nature has to take its course. In the end, he couldn't overcome the infection, and a few days later, he died. But the keepers learned an enormous amount while they were in Kenya and brought that knowledge back to the safari park to help them look after their animals here in the most natural way possible. I've caught up with Mark Tai and Andy Hayton in the appropriate setting of the East African Reserve. Well, it really does look like you both had the most fantastic time in Africa and seeing that elephant must have been amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a seriously awesome day. All, everything we did that day was just out of this world. Couldn't believe it. And what about seeing animals that you, you know, you both know well, you've both worked with animals for a very long time, but suddenly you're seeing them in their wild environment. Is it very different? I think, yeah, it is. You know, you get, I mean, obviously we're used to having fences around here and animals sort of contained, if you like, or even though they've got sort of large areas, but when you see that they can walk for hundreds of miles. That's just something a bit different. These guys are captive. Those are wild. They're completely different sides of the coin. But our animals exhibit behaviour that the animals out so there do, which is a good thing. So there were similarities, you saw that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our animals are living as naturally as we possibly can here because they're exhibiting natural behaviour. Did, did you learn anything when you were out there? I mean, was there, was there anything particular that you've taken away from that experience? Yeah, I won't go back. <laughs> <laughs> Badly. <laughs> I think seeing where the money goes. Yeah. We probably had... Who were, the, the guys who were on that trip saw how Tusk and Labour use money. We actually saw it cost X amount of money to get a plane in the air. It cost X amount of money to buy a pickup to get you however far. Mm. It cost X amount of money to look after these guys, the trackers, who are just absolutely unbelievable. So you see where the money from Tusk and, and, and how they were spend it. So yeah, they're, they're doing good stuff and they're trying to save the elephant. Unfortunately, the elephant died, which is a real shame, but we've heard since then that they've actually found one out there that's as big as him. Wow. So, and, and they didn't know that he was there. So I have two elephants out there that size and nobody knew. It's, it's amazing. Quite phenomenal. Well, I'm really, really pleased you had such a great time. Well, thank quite you. pleased. <laughs> <laughs> You're Thanks. very lucky, but thank you very much yeah. for doing some beautiful films for us. Now all the keepers are back at work, and up in lion country, that means stirring the gene pool. Mafui has been in charge of his pride for eight years now, and to prevent inbreeding, the keepers want to bring in a new male. 
In the wild, Mafui would have been killed or driven out by a younger male already, but he's going to be retired with some of his older lionesses. His son, Kumali, isn't old enough to take over the pride, so he's moving to a zoo by a theme park in Yorkshire. Zazie is also going there, accompanied by her two daughters, Stumpy and Nala. Not long back from watching lions in Africa, head warden Keith Harris has a good understanding of how they behave. In the wild, um, males will go into a pride and they will either kick out or kill the, the existing males. So the, although these are in captivity, that that nature is still in them. They, they will still do exactly the same as a wild lion. So we have to be very careful how we approach the, these problems. Keith knows what has to be done to keep a pride in balance, but that doesn't make it any easier to let lions go. We've seen them every day and you do get attached to them. But uh, you know, on the, the wider yeah. scheme of things, we know that to try and do it any other way would result in these getting killed, which is what you know, we really would not like to happen. It's you know, always sad to see our animals go off, but we know they're going to a good home. And um, the um, next thing is tomorrow um, is, is the loading off. It's even harder for head of section Brian Kent. He's been looking after the lions here for nearly 20 years now, but he'll never get used to losing cubs who were born here. The cubs are about 17 weeks old now. Um, they're getting on fine. They're eating plenty of meat. Seem to be quite settled down. Um, mother, she was quite aggressive when she first came in here. Um, when the cubs were born, you know, obviously it's understandable she's going to protect the cubs. But she has quieted down quite a fair bit now, um, which is a nice thing. You know, obviously you're going to miss them because you got so used to them. But at the end of the day, you know, it's better for them. And it'd be better for the pride. Kamali will be greatly missed too. Less than two years ago, he was a tiny cub without a care in the world. Brian has seen him mature into a fine young male, almost ready to lead a pride of his own. But it can't be here. Kamali, yeah, he's um, a great little lion. I mean. He's just coming out of himself now. Um, it'll be a loss, because he's a good-looking lion and uh, he's got a great character. So uh, it'll be a shame to miss him, you know, see him go. Everything is in place for the move. In just 12 hours' time, these lions will have to be enticed into crates for the 400-mile journey to their new home. We'll be back to see what happens. Fresh back from my adventures in Africa, where I was surrounded by very big animals, I've come down to Pet's Corner to help with some little furry ones. Just like humans, ferrets produce earwax to protect their ear canals from dirt and debris. But they do produce rather a lot of it, and they can get horrid ear mites. It can even make them a bit deaf. So the ferrets in Pet's Corner have their ears cleaned regularly and I've come along to give Sarah Clayson a hand. So what do we have to do? We have to catch them first, do we? Yeah, we catch them each one by one. So okay. There's... Do we have friendlier... Are there friendlier ferrets? There are. Some of them are a bit younger than others and right. some of them are more handled, so... Um... So who should we go for? I'll let you... I'll let there's, you I think there's one in the tyre over there that... Um... Fast asleep! Yeah, bless him. <laughs> Will he mind if we, if we wake him no, up? No, so... we think And literally, so. do I just, just grab them? Yeah, just um, gently oh, how behind his front arm. Sorry to wake you up. Uh, Who is this? This is Hamish, this one. Sorry, Hamish. Very used to being handled, so he's very friendly. Are you Scottish? <laughs> <laughs> how old is Hamish? He's about four years old now. Okay. Good age. So, what do we have to We squeeze it in the ears, do we? Yeah, it was similar to how um, we clean our ears out. It's mm -hmm. a special ear solution, right. for, especially for ferrets. And it just loosens and, uh, the wax, does it? Yeah, yeah, it just goes deep down into okay, the ear. Okay, so what, what should I do? Just hold the head? Yeah, if you've got him there, he's, he's quite sleepy at the moment, so he's probably okay. And then we just put a couple of drops in. Okay, about how many do you put in there? Just, just, a just a, one or two, yep. maybe, and then massage I've the bottom. I've got ferrets, ferrets trying to go up my child's <laughs> leg. Guys, just wait your turn, please, for your ears. Okay, so we're going to do the other side now. Yep. Shall I just hold the head? 
Good. Ooh, there's one behind me as well. <laughs> They're very wriggly little things, aren't they? They are just, very just rascally, your turn, very inquisitive. They, they are like to see what's going on. <laughs> if you scruff okay. it, just bust yeah. it, and then so it, it calms them down a bit, okay. and then makes it a bit easier. So we put okay. one or two drops in. I've got one in. going up my jumper. And then massage. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> are you OK in there? <laughs> Anything nice interesting? Nice in there, I expect. I think, yeah, I think so. So is Hamish done? <laughs> Hamish is all done now, okay, yeah, you can go. OK, there you go, go Hamish. Shall we see who we've got in here? Who do we have? Tell me if this is a nice one, please, a friendly one. Yeah, he is. That's Hamish's brother, that ah, one. That's Angus. Hamish's brother. Right, shall I try and do the drops this time? Yeah. Do you want to, yeah, do you want sure. to hold? So who's that? That's... Angus. And how old is Angus? Angus is the same age, four okay, years. right. They're not twins, though, obviously. Uh, <laughs> different well, colours. <laughs> yeah, basically, their parents were probably different, so right. you kind of get different mixtures. So just mixtures. squeeze that in. Please. Okay, okay, here we go. Just a set. like that. And how often do you have to do this? Um, every few weeks. Their nails grow quite quickly as mm -hmm. well. So when we do their nails, we tend to just give their ears, check over and make right. sure they're clean. Come on, Angus. Good boy. So you just rub the ear at the end. Is that just to make sure that it all goes it inside? It goes right down, deep down, yeah, to un um, block all the, and loosen all the dirt that's in there. So, right. yeah. There we go. Right, who else do we have? There's one... I don't know how you recognise it. Who's this? Hamish. That's Hamish. Hamish, you've <laughs> you been done. You get to know him eventually. <laughs> Hamish wants to be done again. Right, let's find someone else who hasn't been done. I think there's some asleep over here. OK. Oh, blimey. It looks like we have a lot of ferrets ahead of us. I think you better leave us to us. OK, come on. Next one. <laughs> Not long ago, Darren Beasley was out in the wilds of Africa too. Now, as head of section, he's settling back into the daily routine of running Pets Corner. Uh, I'm just collecting some, some blossom and some leaves now uh, for what is actually the smallest member of the Pets Corner animal team. <laughs> But, hey, but the most numerous, this is my fun job, I feel like, I feel like I'm getting married here, um, but the most numerous, we have um, a huge colony of leafcutter ants in Pets Corner, and they're amazing creatures. They've been on the planet for thousands of years, and I can safely say they were the first ever farmers on the planet, and this is for them. Uh, and I've got to go and feed it to them because they get through a huge amount. It's a huge colony, I mean, there's millions of them in there. The ant colony is highly organised. First, the scouts search out food. Then the leaf cutters move in, while the soldier ants keep watch. It's very popular with all our visitors that we've got around today. They come in and they see, they, they see the ants following the trail, but they are carrying the green leaf, they're carrying the pink blossom, and there's an interesting fact we put on our window here for them to... because it's hard to explain, because you've really got to look... That, if an ant was the same size as you, it could carry 200 kilograms, I mean, that's a huge weight, for over 30 miles at 15 miles an hour. Now, you imagine that. You see these big butch marine soldiers carrying their, their bergens and their knapsacks. They're, they're pussycats compared to these guys. These are the strong, strong, strong creatures. To get a closer look at the amazing world of these tiny creatures, wildlife cameraman Jonathan Watts has brought an endoscope camera which is normally used for keyhole surgery. It gives us a, a wide-angle view from really close up, um, and it gives you some idea of how big the ants are. It gives you a really nice feel. Should so, I open this up and have a look? Yeah, let's see if we can get a... Whoops. Oh, see if we can get a picture and move that in. Oh, they're active. I've actually seen these in Costa Rica. They're amazing. Yeah. Um, in the rainforests, and they'll go all the way up the trees, all the way up into the canopy, and all the way down to the bottom into the nest. That's and there can be small bushes or other things down at ground level and yet they're going, they're going all, all, the way, the all the way to the top. Huge amount of energy used but because they presumably want those particular space. Yeah, yeah. To get the very best pictures, Jonathan experiments with different cameras and often builds a special rig. The results are high tech, but the rig doesn't have to be. What I'm doing is using a miniature camera, um, which is actually just stuck on the end of this... Um, uh, fixing a slide with a piece of blue tack. It's a little bit crude, but um, as you can see, you can get right in close. Once the ants have chosen a suitable leaf, which they hold on to with tiny hooks on their legs, the leaf cutters use their powerful mandible jaws, which vibrate at a thousand times a second, like a chainsaw. They then carry the leaf in a ridge on their heads and follow a scent trail back to the nest. 
The leaves are now left to rot until fungus starts to grow on them, which is what the colony actually feeds on. Hi, Jonathan. How do you get on? Hi, fine. Yeah, look. Oh, I can see the... Brilliant. Look at that. Carrying leaves through frame and everything is beautiful. That is fantastic. Do you know, you don't realise how fast, until you're in close, look how fast they are actually travelling. They're going at oh, speed, yeah. aren't they? The, some of them sort of carrying sort of really quite large petals yeah. and yeah. others, that's a chopped leaf. And this is one with Animal Park on it. Fantastic. They'll shift anything. He probably thinks that's rubbish, doesn't he? He's just going to dump that out of the way, look. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Jonathan's next task will be a close encounter with one of the most feared beasts on the planet, a poisonous tarantula. We'll come back to find out just how close he dares to get. Up at the Lion House, it's a big day for Kamali, Sazi and the cubs, who are all moving up to Flamingo Land in Yorkshire. But these are lions. You can't just pop them in a taxi. So keepers Bob Trollope and Brian Kent have the difficult and potentially very dangerous job of finding a way to get them into secure crates for the journey. They don't want to frighten or stress the lions any more than is absolutely necessary. So the plan is to lure them in, starting with Kumali. That's part one. That's easy. <laughs> We've managed to get Kamali into the, the back tunnel. And what we're going to do now is bring a box in and hopefully coax him back in. Bob and Brian are experienced lion handlers and they know that it's times like this, moving lions, that are the most dangerous. You've got to keep checking that everything is safely done, everything's locked. You haven't missed anything because, you know, you don't want to make a mistake, get someone injured. So, you know, you've really got to be careful. The Yorkshire keepers have sent their own crates down and, not surprisingly, they don't fit very well here. Ready? Hmm. As you can see, it's uh, not flush to the wall because of the handles. So we've got gaps already. But if you wanted to try and squeeze through there, you try its hardest. It's surprisingly the amount of strength that an animal, especially if it's slightly frightened, can have. Craig's come up with an idea. Put these doors of ours on the side here, so it's blocked the gap off a bit, as you can see. It's a bit more safer now. So Craig's going to have to sit out there very quiet. Well, I'll go around there and move Kamali into this area and hopefully give Brian a shout and he'll open the slide up and Kamali will rush in. Easy. All right, you get in here. Come on, get in there, get in there. Good boy. Come on, get in there. Come on, mate. Come on. Here. Hey, come on, get in there. It might pay if you just open it up, see if it goes in. Look, you can go back in there. Come on. Good boy, good boy. Come on up. OK, lower it. Come on, this tail, go on, go on, Craig. That's it. Perfect, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just hope that it works on Maybe all of them. <laughs> so that's one down and three to go. But Zazie has cubs and a mother's instincts. Zazie's a little bit stressed because she's been watching what's going on, obviously knows something's up. She's obviously a little bit concerned, more so for the safety of her cubs, um, which is you know, you know, admirable and understandable. They will go in there, because curiosity is going to get them in there. Mum's going to obviously play a major part. A little bit more concerned about this one, because that's always a one that is set back. She's a little bit less of a character than the other. Each crate is designed to take one adult lion, so Bob and Brian have decided to separate Zazie from her cubs. That way, she can't accidentally injure them on the journey but her crate will be right alongside theirs so they can all hear and smell each other for reassurance. Basically, what I'm going to do now is try and 
split the cubs up from mum. So I need either two cubs in here or Sazzy there. I don't mind which, it's just to get them split up. Oops. Like that. So far, yeah, it's uh, going pretty well, but don't want to shout too soon. <laughs> Anyone who's ever tried to put a domestic moggy into a travel cage knows just how hard it is, never mind a lion. We'll come back to see whether Zazie decides to cooperate. At Pet's Corner, specialist cameraman Jonathan Watts is ready to tackle another mini beast. Over the last 20 years, he's filmed wildlife all around the world and has had more than his share of hair-raising experiences. I think probably one of the scariest moments was, um, was filming a cobra in, in, the, um, in the desert. Um, and it was, I was on a longish lens, and I'd got it coming towards me, going like this, from side to side. And I thought, OK, very nice shot. Now I'll let it go out through the bottom of frame. And as its tail went out through the bottom of frame, I felt it go up my trouser leg. <laughs> so I, I remained absolutely still, um, and uh, it was absolutely fine. But Jonathan's next challenge is to face one of the most feared animals in Pet's Corner, a Chilean rose tarantula. Darren Beasley is keen to find out if the spider is male or female, which is not at all easy with the naked eye. We tend not to sex any of the, the spiders because we don't need to. We keep them all separate anyway. But the males have, if you like, sort of vestigial legs or fingers, if you like, on their front legs. Right. And on the very front of the, of the palps, they've got uh, small, like, I call them horny tips, but like points. Right. And that's what they use to pass when they're mating. They pass it over. But the ones, the best ones, actually, the ones on the front legs are great. They use them as interlockers. The hooks of her pinning back the female's fangs while she mates. Female tarantulas are, of course, famous for then killing and eating their partners. Although since they have eight eyes and hairy legs, it seems surprising they ever find a mate. What we're looking for is on the spider, on the front pedipalps, on, on, on the front two legs, you, you've got two little, little points, if you like. Look, I, say, I call them vestigials, they're, they're tiny little hooks. And I can see on here really clearly, I could, probably with the naked eye if I can get close enough to the spider, but there are none there. now. So does that make it a male or a female? That makes it a little girl, this one. Unlike the less fortunate males, female tarantulas have been known to live for up to 30 years. In the wild, they're nocturnal hunters who live mainly on insects. Despite all their eyes, tarantulas don't see very well and rely on picking up vibrations with their leg hairs to find their prey which they then inject with enough poison to kill a small lizard. Darren feeds them crickets twice a week. I'll just offer her a cricket, but this is a, a million and one chance. If we could see her eating, eating on camera, would be fantastic to see from below, see the cricket's eye view. She did go to grab it, and it just outran her a little bit. Bless her. <laughs> What's the chances, wasn't it, eh? What's the chances of that? Well, that was pretty much as we expected, is that um, despite all the, all the close-in camera work, the spider just didn't want to eat, didn't feel comfortable in that surroundings, hadn't set its little net trap, web trap. Um, doesn't matter, they are comfortable eating in the boxes, so we'll feed them in their boxes, and we've got lots of other brilliant shots, so I'm really pleased. arrivals in the safari park are some African bongos and they're looked after by head of section Tim Yeo, not long returned from Kenya himself. Absolutely stunning, aren't they? Now you've got, we can see one here, but you've yes, got... Yes, three, mm, three right. young males of, of just about eight months of age. Okay, so just males, no females yet? 
<laughs> yeah, it's our first time here at the park to, to, to keep these animals, and uh, it really is a, a situation where we're going right. to see how we get on. Yeah. You know, if they suit uh, the management regime here, yeah. then I think, you know, certainly steps are going to be, be taken to, uh, to hopefully, um, you know, start a breeding program here. Oh, that would be fantastic. I mean, are they endangered in the wild? They're from Africa, aren't they? Uh, Central East Africa right. and um, they're not uh, critically endangered but they're like many other species their, their habitat is is being encroached on yeah. all the time and uh, illegal hunting is is an issue certainly so any successful breeding program that you could have here would be good generally for the species I think most certainly I think it must be if we can breed them in, in this sort of controlled situation here it would be really wonderful. I mean, they're so beautiful. I can only imagine what their babies would look like. They'd be stunning, I think. Tim, thank you very much. And here is what's still to come on today's programme. Will the keepers ever get the lioness into her crate and up to Yorkshire? Down a bit, down a bit. Oh, no, 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 too late. Gorillas are much more like us than you think. Yes, very similar to humans. They, you know, colds, colds and flu can be very dangerous for them. Yeah. You know, can give, lead to pneumonia and eventually death. And Rothschild giraffe are really rare in the wilds of Africa, but there are lots of them in Wiltshire. I believe we've had over 100 giraffe born at Longleat. That's since. quite something, isn't it? It's a really, really good breeding record. But before all that, we're going back to the lion house where Bob Trollope and Brian Kent have already persuaded Kumali into a crate ready for the journey to Flamingo Land in Yorkshire. Zazie and the cubs are going too, and although the move is good for all the lions involved, Bob will miss them. Obviously, it's in the back of your mind that you are losing four lions and four young lions, and you know, especially. With the two cubs, there's nothing better than watching cubs grow up and start their families of their own. It's a shame, but you know, it's to to you know, to help us out in the long run, so we can get new bloodlines in and things like that. With three cats to handle, Bob and Brian have called in Tim Yeo, head of the neighbouring new area, a very experienced animal handler who's worked with big cats before and, of course, saw them in the wild only a couple of weeks ago. We just need someone quickly to open the slide. Oh, good, not lifting me? No, no, oh, no, not at yeah. the moment. But our way of thinking is if the cubs go in, quickly shut the door down, go to the next one, then mum will be concerned about where the cubs are, so this year walk straight in. Where it works like that is another story. Yeah, of course it will. Of course it will. With such young cubs and a heavy steel crate, this is a very tricky part of the operation. But you just got to be careful, uh, you know, to clear their tails through, because you can't see, you know, how close it is, where, how far they're in. So I've got to rely on Bob to make sure it's all clear. Ready when you are, Tim. <laughs> Go on then, go on. No, 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 no. Go that way. Go on. Go on. Might be just be a, a matter of waiting for him to build up courage. Go on. All right, darling. All right. Get in there. Go on, Cubby. No, 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 no. You don't want to do that. Get in. Go on. Go on. Get in. Go on. Get in. It was a good try. But since the cubs have decided to play up, rather than play along, Bob turns his attention to Zazie. Hello, darling. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, Tim. Go on, girl. Go on. Good girl. Good girl. She's looking half it. Oh, no. Obviously, she knows it's a trap. <laughs> She's not that stupid to realise it isn't. Um, go on. Go, go. go on then, shut it, shut it, mind the tail, mind the tail. Down a bit, down a bit. Down, oh, no, 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 too late. Up. So near and yet so far. If they had to, the keepers could sedate Zazzy. But animals can die under anaesthetic, so they won't even consider it until they've run out of other ideas. It's the old funnel trick. <laughs> What's the funnel trick then? Well, hopefully, because, I, well, I'm going to... It might not work, I might make myself look like... But 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow down here, and it's going to be something that she isn't familiar with. So hopefully, it might just unnerve her enough to sort of go in the box out of the way. But it's, you know, it's just another thing to try, isn't it? All right. Wait, Saz. <laughs> You know. That obviously isn't going to work. <laughs> Let's throw it on the cubbies. Come on. Come on. What's this? Go on. I'm supposed to lick it. No, don't eat it. Go on. Get in there. Go on. I'm just going to try and sway them with a the broom handle. It's um, not going to hurt them in any way. Just encourage them towards the door a bit more. Go on. Go on. Gotta go in. No, don't eat it. No, you wanna go. Get in the box. Go on. Good girl. We want your sister in there. <laughs> yeah. Just stumpy now, wants to play with a stick. Well, one cub's been in. Backwards. It's just obviously it's gonna take time. We could be here all day at this rate. So now the old funnel trick and the twin broom wheeze have failed. What else can Bob come up with to outwit Zazie? Obviously, Cub's next door. She's still trying to protect him as such. So it might pay for us just to sort of back right out of the way, leave her a bit of time, just to uh, chill out a bit and then see if she goes in on her own accord. Six inches and that would be it. So this is the third time lucky, isn't it? Think on the positive side, third time lucky. Ooh. She's been in there twice. <laughs> Forward and backwards, and now this time she's going to go in. Go on. Go on. Just as Bob predicted, with everyone out of sight and the pressure off, Zazie suddenly makes the right move. Oh, that's down. Zazie's in. The um, main thing is now is to Put the padlock on, then go for the cubs. Close it! Down. Close it, go down, on! Down, 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 down! Now their mum's inside, the cubs are quick to follow. Job done. Cubs are in. After almost four hours of playing big cat and mouse with the lions, the crates can be loaded onto the transporter at last. But it's precisely because lions are intelligent and challenging animals that Bob and Brian enjoy working with them. Those are lovely animals, the cubs are brilliant, and you just got to wave them goodbye. Um, but we'll get on with it and hopefully we'll have some more of our own. Babies being born all the time somewhere in the safari park. And while the head of the giraffery, Andy Hayton, was watching wild ones out in Kenya, two baby giraffes were born here, and he's keen to show them off. So, Andy, who are we going to see today? Eliza and Ella, uh, the two, ah. two baby giraffes. Presumably here? Yep. So, um, which is which? Ella's the darker one on the uh, right hand right, side. Right next to the tree. Yep. And Eliza's up there with Ella's mum, Jemima. So how old are they now? Uh, they were born last, uh, last summer, so about eight, nine months old now. They're already incredibly tall. Have you any idea of their height? No, uh, they must be seven and a half foot. They're coming on. And I have to ask, when a giraffe is born, <laughs> how tall are they and how do they, how, uh, how do they come out of their mothers? <laughs> Mums actually give birth standing up um, and they're about six foot tall when they're born. So the Blimey. babies hit the, hit the so, ground. So, so it's quite a, a drop, really? Yeah, I mean, the head and neck's invariably out, so the head doesn't have that far to fall. Mm -hmm. And it's not a huge crash, as you'd think it was. It, it, they do actually land quite gently, but it's a kind of a stimulation thing. When they hit the ground, it, it stimulates them to breathe and kind of get going. So it's, it's, it's all designed to work. And obviously popular with, um, with the visitors, <laughs> with all the yeah. cars that are around us now. Yeah, all the baby animals are always popular. You get some small animals out of here. Of course. And, and, and the people love it. Now, what are, these guys, are they still suckling? Um, Jolly's actually weaned 
So, Eliza now. And you say jo is Jolly around? That's Jolly's, one of them, Jolly's, ones, Jolly's at the far end of the park. She's one yeah, of right, these. So she's abandoned. Of... She's, she's given up already. Yeah, she? She, she does a little bit and that's it, fend for yourself kind of thing. <laughs> Jemima's a first time mum, so she's a little bit softer. So and is, is that Jemima that's, over there? That's Jemima there, right. which is another one of Jolly's daughters as well. So, oh, right. So uh, you've got generation after generation here. Yeah, uh, Ella is uh, Eliza's niece. And Ella is Jolly's granddaughter, so it's it's nice. Again, the visitors like it when you start getting this family thing working. Something to relate to. Have you ever have you ever counted how many giraffes have been born here at Longleat? I believe we've had over a hundred giraffe born at Longleat. That's quite something, isn't it? A really, really good breeding record. And have they integrated with the rest of the giraffe? What do you call a collective group? A tower. <laughs> a tower. Tower of giraffe. Are, are they all getting along? And have they integrated with the tower of giraffes here? They're fine. We get them into the routine as quickly as we possibly can. If the animals are healthy and they're doing fine and mum's looking after them and the weather's pretty good, get them out, get them, get them running with the group. OK, who are we off to see next? Uh, young Flynn, our new, uh, new okay. zebra. Should we get Ryan to... Can we go on to see the zebs, please? So young Flynn is, um, is the newborn Yeah, he was, zebra. He, he's a month old. He was born in February this year. Right. Which is a probably most atrocious time of the year that you could possibly be introduced to this world. But he's doing great as well. He's uh, Jinga's first, first right. baby and, again, another first-time mum. Have you so, ever seen a, a zebra born? We, I, I think there's only ever possibly been one zebra been seen to be born here. Really? But they, norm, they normally give birth in the middle of the night. It's just, again, an instinctive protection thing. You know, for, for predators. Right. So you just turn up in the morning. Turn and up in the morning. A, a we, baby zebra. we normally have a very good idea that they're going to give birth because there's there's actual physical signs that you can see. Mum's getting agitated, things like that. Right. Um, it's looking very frisky. Oh, they're brilliant. <laughs> baby zebras are absolutely brilliant. You know, they just they get up and get going. Again, you know, that's what they have to do in the wild to survive. You get to your feet and you get moving and follow mum. So where's Flynn's mum? Flynn's mum's right behind him. Uh, that's Jinga there. With really a solid stripes. Yeah, she's a really nice looking zebra. Absolutely fantastic looking. So presumably he's still suckling, is he? He'll still suckle till he's about nine months old. And then she'll get fed up with him and tell him in no uncertain terms that's his lot, really. Well, Andy, thank you very much for, um, for bringing us out today on a rather gloomy <laughs> English day. But it's great to see that all the youngsters are doing so well. The lions from the safari park are safely on their way to their new home at Flamingoland in North Yorkshire, where they haven't had lions for more than two years now. They've been building a new one and a half million pound lion enclosure, and Kamali, Zazi, Stumpy and Nala are the first of up to 20 lions to move in. Dean Cross will be looking after them. Right, so here we are in the, the new indoor quarters at Flamingoland for the lions. And we've built this over the winter, and you can see it's quite, a, quite an impressive structure. So we're hoping to get them in here in the, the next week or so, um, and uh, see how it goes, really. See various things we've got from. We've got an extremely large scratching pole, which is, a lot of that's cosmetic, but they will actually use it. We've got a large tree in here, plenty of slopes for them to come up. The lions will have the run of this impressive indoor house, which has a public viewing gallery, as well as a two-acre outdoor paddock, complete with pool. So here we are coming up to the, the third level, which the cats have access to. And you can see they're, uh, they're at window height, so they can view out everywhere and um, see all the things that are around them. You see, we've still got a little bit of construction work to do here, but we should have that done within in three weeks, we're, we're estimating. The more you can put in, the more enriching it is for them. And with that, we've just taken care of everything we can think of, really. There's, there's every, anything in there from different textures and substrates and, you know, things to rub against. There'll be lots of smells and, and different things. So there's, it's just a whole environment we've set up for them, really. After a six-hour drive, the new lions arrive at last and the Flamingo Land team gets straight on with the unloading. They don't want to keep the big cats cooped up any longer than necessary. Longleat's head warden, Keith Harris, has travelled with the lions, and local vet, Matthew Brash, is standing by to check on their health. And have somebody... We, I go for shut that, and we have that one open with somebody on that gate there. Well, I want to make sure that they haven't injured themselves in transit. Now, to be fair, the boxes are designed, the likelihood is tiny. But you just never know, really. 
Um, and then also, of course, when they come out, they're into a strange environment. And they could just do something really stupid. So that's the other reason. I'm a bit like a being an umbrella here, really. You know, I'm here just in case something does happen. This door here. The cubs are the first to be unloaded, followed by Zazi. It's been a long and tiring day for her, so everyone's hoping that she won't be in a bad mood. She's just sat in there quiet. She's just looking, and as you expect, that, you know, she's slightly nervous at the new surroundings. She can't see the youngsters, which are up the other end at the moment. But um, it's one of those things, just give her time, even if you've got to walk away and leave her for a while. Yeah, she's stood up, she's out. No, she's not out. She's just thinking about it. OK, she's out. OK? And down. She's out, she's back with the cubs, and hopefully they'll all quickly settle into their new home. Through a system of doors, they've got a huge indoor enclosure. It's probably one of the biggest I've seen of a, a zoo. And then the outdoor enclosure is, is absolutely massive. So it's going to be like home from home once they get settled. But it's going to be a, a slow process of them getting used to it. Um, you can just hear her in the background just telling people off. But um, she's just gone back with the cubs now, and she'll... Uh, uh, you know, once we've finished and unloaded the mail, they'll be left quiet for the night, and then we'll see how they are in the morning. It's gone really well. They've come out very quietly, got the cubs out first down to the far corner, got mum in with them. She's nice there. She's protecting them. She spotted the vet a mile off, well, immediately went for me, so she's not dove. She knows the vets. And uh, we're just quietly waiting for the mail to come out. So it's gone very smoothly. He seems to be too comfortable in his beautiful crate, and he's, he's the wrong way around, so... I'm sure he will come out shortly, but the female's now starting to call him, so, so hopefully he'll get, a, get his skates on in a minute. While Zazie is content to guard her cubs, Kamali, as a male, will want to check everything out. For now, he's best left on his own, but we'll come back to see how they're all getting on in the morning. Of all the animals back at Longleat, only two enjoy their own house with colour TV on an exclusive island. Nico and Samba are looked after by the head of lake animals, Mark Tai, who was also out in Africa with us. But we didn't see any gorillas in the wild because we weren't in the right area. Now, Nico and Samba are safely back in the house. He's brought me to see them. How are they getting on? Very well, actually, yeah. Samba's... Um... <laughs> Cheesed off with Nico, as per usual. <laughs> they do, they've always bickered, really, haven't they? They do always bicker, particularly when Nico's trying to grab hold of a cameraman. <laughs> so Samba always tries to have a bit of a go back. So she's, she's basically protecting our cameraman, is she? Is yeah. she saying, oi, leave him alone, he's all right? Yeah, she's always looking after someone. How old are they both now? Well, they're both 45 now. Wow. That's, that, I mean, is, is that old <laughs> even for a captive gorilla? Yes, it is. I mean... You know, a lot of wild gorillas would probably be long gone by 25. Wow. Um, and with the obvious problems of poaching, you know, bushmeat trade. Yeah. Um, and also ill health with things like tooth problems. And captive gorillas sort of can be between 30 and 40. So, I mean, for these two at 45, well, it's, it's pretty good going. Getting on for record breakers. And, and talking <laughs> of health problems, I know that particularly Nico <clears throat> has had more than his fair share. How are they getting on at the moment? The, very well, yeah, I can't complain at all. I mean, obviously, we, you know, coming out of winter is normally a, a hard time for any animal. Well, and people. And people as well, <laughs> yeah. Um, and they've come out of winter really well, and, and so hopefully it can only get better for them, you know, a bit of sun on their backs. Yeah. It always, always works treats for everything, doesn't it? But I did notice you've got <clears> a sort of a little pharmacy set yeah, up here. slightly. <laughs> <laughs> what are all these things for? Um, well, part of Nico's problem that he had a few years ago was was still sort of ongoing with a small treatment just to make sure it stays because he had a, he had sort of he basically had bad diarrhea didn't yes, he yes a lot of stomach problems yeah um so we keep keep him on a low dose of some of the medicines we were okay. using originally and that's just, a sort of just in case a just in case thing yeah and it keeps him you know it doesn't give him any problems and it keeps him Keeps him quiet. <laughs> Ish. Ish. So, so how do you give him this? Well, this is just aloe vera juice. Oh, look at that! And he'll just take that straight from the syringe, and hopefully, that's amazing. Hopefully, he won't. So you're trying a sort of natural remedies, aloe vera. Yes, and the other thing we have here is natural yogurt. Wow. Which again is good oh, again, for stomach Oh, again, because it's because they've got the sort of bacteria yep. in it, and he just takes it off the spoon. And he will 
Take that off the spoon. That's amazing. Normally very good. <laughs> Every now and again he does try and take the spoon for himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the most noticeable difference between the two of them is that he is much greyer than she is. Is yeah. it just because he's sort of <clears throat> aged a little less gracefully or is that because he's male? No, it's because he's the dominant male. Yeah. And that's called being a silverback. Right. Which he would get as in, a, in, any, in a group of gorillas which he... If he became the dominant male, probably about 10, 11, 12 years old. And it's only the dominant male, so the other males would stay black, would they? Yes, they would. They could be called black back males. Right. Um, but also, with being his age, there yeah. is an awful lot of just genuine grey hair there. I mean, if you look at Samba's back as well, she's quite, oh, she's, quite a yeah, silvery she is, colour. She is getting a little bit, a little is, bit salt and peppery, yeah, isn't and she? that's purely old age. <laughs> <laughs> so he's done with the yoghurt. What next? Yeah that and also they have vitamin tablets right and we have some multivitamin tablets and some vitamin C tablets I mean do, do gorillas get colds <laughs> do they get sort of diseases that are quite similar to humans yes very similar to humans they you know colds colds and flu can be very dangerous for them yeah you know can give, lead to pneumonia and eventually death um, so obviously vitamin C is a major major part of their diet obviously which they get a lot of in the fruit and vegetables and yeah. stuff, but it doesn't hurt to give them a bit, of, a bit extra as well. Samba's a bit on the more fussy side, and she won't take those ones. She likes the soft, chewy ones. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have they got... I know it's, it's, it's sort of dangerous to, to humanise animals too much, but have they got very distinct personalities, and how have you seen them change over the years? Um, yeah, they've got very distinct personalities. Samba's a very sort of laid-back laid -back girl, if you like. She doesn't get too upset by many things, you know, things don't bother her that much, apart from Nico, obviously. <laughs> um, and she's, she's very protective of people. Yeah. You know, if, it's like we said, if, if he has a go at somebody, she sticks up for us kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and he's the complete opposite to that. He's, he can be very quiet and he'll sit there quite happy and then all of a sudden, click, and he can just turn into a real stroppy individual. Grumpy start, old man. Grumpy old man will start bashing the barrel round in the cage, throwing <laughs> straw up in the air and generally being a bit of a nonsense. Really. <laughs> Bananas? Bananas. Just a bit of a good morning Cute. treat, really. Am I allowed to give one to Nico? You, you can, if you're very Sandra. careful. OK. If you hold it right on the end. Right on the end just, there. And just hand, on, it, hand it to his mouth. Think, well, it's very, very nice to see you again. There you are, old fella. And Samba, taken hers. Mark, thank you very, very much. Always a treat, and just lovely to see them looking great. Thank you, no problem. Back up in Yorkshire, the four lions who've come from Longleat are waking up in their new home for the first time, and keeper Dean Cross has come to see how they're getting on. Hello, then. How are you doing, eh? They're settling quite well, obviously they're quiet, so that's not unusual when you, you move cats. But um, they're, they ate well last night, so, so I'm not too worried about them. We've we'll been keeping them in here separate for, for two days, and then we'll probably mix them in here, just so that we, we know that they're not going to do anything silly. And then probably within three to four days, we might, might let them have the, the big house to, um, to run in. This male is, is not related to the female. These are actually his cubs. So we have to be a bit careful that, that um, he doesn't get startled and maybe hurt one of them, because they are actually quite boisterous, these two little cubs. So, so that's, that's the reason why. We're just, just trying to look after the cubs, really, and make sure nothing happens to them. Before embarking on the long drive back to Wiltshire, morning, Keith guys. Harris has Good dropped morning. in to say his farewells. How are we this morning? Oh, hello, new home. You always worry because it, it is stressful for them and, um, you know, coming to a new home. But the thing is now that they can mark this, or they will do, as their own territory in their own home. So it won't take them long. Um, and seeing them this morning, they're quite relaxed in here. And, um, you know, they're getting used to the noises because the noises and smells are all different. So, it, no, it's nice to see. Nice to know that, um, you know, when I go, that the, the lions are quite happy. The, you, you always feel, you know, animals... Uh, leaving um, and for the for the staff obviously you know they've known the cubs since they were tiny 
But um, again, knowing that they're coming to a new home, and it's the reasons why, you know, that it's going to improve everybody's life at the end of the day. That's, that's the main thing. Um, you know, this is set up now as a small breeding group, which can grow quite quickly to a, quite a larger group. So all round, it's an improvement, and I think that's the way we just got to keep thinking about it. Kate and I are up at the goat enclosure with Keeper Bev Evans to help out <laughs> with a spot of feeding and a spot of grooming. Is that right, Bev? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> What's the plan? <laughs> um, well, at the moment, our goats are actually losing a lot of their winter coats. Right. Um, so we just come up to give them a bit of a brush, okay. a bit of a tidy up. Can't, literally... they, can't they lose it by themselves? Um, they do. They'll rub along the fence lines and it does come out, um, but they just look really scruffy. Um, so we're just giving them a helping hand by brushing them, yes. OK, well, do, do you want to carry on feeding okay, in our, well, in our yeah, brush? That's a, fair, that's a fair <laughs> so plan. It, it, um, now, this looks, this looks quite hard, Bev, this plastic uh, bud brush. Is it all right? Um, no, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's, it bends quite a bit, and, right. and it, it just does the job. It really so gets just, the... So just brush down like that, right. exactly as you would a, a horse or yep, a, a dog definitely. or something? Just go with it, you know. Um, <laughs> That's very <laughs> ungrateful. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to try this one. That's because... Poppadom. Poppadom. Oh, oh no, no Poppadom doesn't Poppadum. like it either. <laughs> <laughs> no. Come on, Ben, you're not doing a very know, good wrangling Let me see job. if I... Shall I, shall I have a go? Here we are. Here we are. Look, this is like brushing my two way, then we can hold Poppadom in place. Oh, well done. Now, would would Poppadom want um, he or she? A he. He has shed his entire coat. Will he be short-haired like the others? No, not at all. What we're actually getting, though, is, is this winter, this really woolly kind of cotton wool kind of uh, winter coat. Um, oh, right. And that's all that's coming out at the moment. So he'll still be a long hair. still be a long hair, yes. In, in the summer. Well, I think we need to hurry up because I'm really being mobbed here. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, we'll carry on here. Sadly, that's all we've got time for today. But here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. The new lion's feeling frisky. But will the girls fall for his charms or go for his throat? They could work as a team and give him a bit of a pasting. There's a new male at Meerkat Mountain too, and there are five females in the neighbouring pen. You can smell them quite strongly in here, so he's probably keen to get close to them. And in the cellars beneath Longleat House, there's a tale of ghosts and gruesome murder. This is where he was actually dug up. That's all in the next... Animal Park.